Hi there, Opera Folk. It's good to be back with you for our fourth and final uh, broadcast of this Virginia opera season. And uh, in choosing the Mikado of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, this is a choice with a lot of serendipity going for it on many levels. For one thing, uh, you're hearing us immediately following the Metropolitan Opera broadcast of Verdi's Aida, which we hope you enjoyed. And, of course, Virginia Opera began our season back in October with our company premiere of Aida. So to have Aida and Mikado back-to-back on Saturday afternoon is kind of bookends uh, for the Virginia Opera season. Uh, Secondly, uh, this is two consecutive seasons in which we at Virginia Opera have closed our uh, run of performances with a Japanese opera. Of course, last year it was Puccini's favorite, Madama Butterfly, and now Gilbert and Sullivan's Japanese opera, Mikado. And third, uh, you know, let's talk about Orfe that we just finished. Uh, Gil- uh, uh, Philip Glass's Orfe, our brilliant, uh, in my humble opinion, production that was very well received by the public and critics. We're happy to report. You know, For those who have to market opera to the public, contemporary opera by living composers can be a tough sell. Uh, If you compare it to food, I suppose it would be the vegetables of the operatic menu. Uh, You know, think of it as the musical cauliflower. And so opera companies are a little like your mom at times. Your mom wouldn't let you eat your dessert until you had cleaned your plate and finished all your vegetables. Well, you came out and supported uh, Philip Glass's Orfe. Uh, we had eight successful performances. You ate all your vegetables. So now you get your cherry cobbler. or cherry blossom cobbler, maybe, uh, with the Mikado. See, we reward you with something fun. However, here's the third layer of serendipity. It's actually two consecutive productions by composers who have treated the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice in their compositions. Uh, Following Philip Glass, now we have Arthur Sullivan. Long before he began to think of the Mikado, young Arthur Sullivan, fresh out of uh, music school in Germany, Uh, One of his first published compositions was a group of five Shakespearean songs, including Orpheus with his lute. So how about that? You see the lengths we go to, the the intricacies of the planning process that go... Actually, it's coincidence. But I can't resist. Just as a segue from Philip Glass, let's hear just a little bit of uh, Arthur Sullivan's Orpheus song. And there you have it. Well, that takes care of Orpheus. Ta-ta, ciao, and Godspeed to you and your lovely wife, Eurydice. And on to the Mikado. Uh, Look, a discussion of the Mikado is not going to involve light motifs or intricate discussions of musical counterpoint. The fact is that any Gilbert and Sullivan production, and particularly the Mikado, there is one objective to every word of lyrics and libretto and every note of music to make us laugh. It's all just about humor. But, you know, it's, it's that phenomenon that we call British humor. So I think largely today what we're going to be discussing is the nature of British humor. What makes you laugh? Everybody likes to laugh, but there are cultural differences, I think. I'm not sure that American humor uh, is really very similar to British humor. I've been reading about this and making some of my own observations, and I've identified some real distinctions between uh, the way the British approach humor and the way Americans do. You know, there are really four countries that have produced 
uh, significant operettas. Those are uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, <coughs> France with Jacques Offenbach, Germany with, of course, the Strausses and Franz Lehar's Merry Widow, and the United States with, uh, oh, Victor Herbert, Babes in Toyland, and even uh, a lot of Rodgers and Hammerstein and early musical theater like Oklahoma. Those are essentially American operettas. And I find that the British and French operettas are more similar in style and the nature of the humor. Uh, and another parallel would be American with German. So let's talk about that a little bit and see if we can figure out some of these distinctions. When you think about American humor, and I'm going to reference uh, situation comedies on TV that you may be familiar with from different generations of TV history, starting back with I Love Lucy, uh, The Andy Griffith Show, Dick Van Dyke, Oh, more recent ones like uh, Home Improvement with Tim Allen, Friends, almost any sitcom that you can mention, The Cosby Show especially. Americans like to laugh in recognition of ourselves. American uh, co comedians, comic characters, tend to be portrayed fairly realistically. Uh, think of some, you know, when The Cosby Show went on NBC in the 1980s. It was the first African-American family to be depicted in primetime television. And so it was really important that they be portrayed as normal and typical an American family as possible. Nothing too exaggerated, nothing too bizarre, uh, So because they didn't want to reinforce stereotypes that people may have had. So uh, Bill Cosby was the average happy-go-lucky dad, nice children who are a little mischievous, a wise maternal mother figure, and so forth. Think of Aunt B from Andy Griffith. Everybody has known a sweet Southern grandmotherly type like that, uh, very naive and uh, caring about people and maybe a little bit ditzy. Uh, when we see these people, we laugh in recognition because we, when we see the little scrapes they get into and the foolish decisions they make, we nod to ourselves and say, yeah, I've done things like that sometimes. So we laugh at our own foolishness because there it is on the screen. Such is not the case with British comedy. Think of some of the British TV shows that you're familiar with. Oh, uh, you see them on uh, PBS, on public broadcasting TV. There's Faulty Towers, Black Adder, Are You Being Served? And from an earlier generation, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Monty Python is the great-grandchild of W.S. Gilbert. Because what, uh, you know, if Americans like to laugh with the characters because they resemble us, the British wind up laughing at the characters because they're so absurd and nonsensical that it's no longer possible to recognize ourselves uh, on the screen up there. You know, I think of a Monty Python sketch that was called The Ministers of Silly Walks. It showed a bureau bureaucratic office in downtown London, right next to, you know, Homeland Security or the Ministry of the Finance and so forth. And it was the Ministry of Silly Walks. And you saw very dignified bureaucrats dressed in three-piece black suits carrying attache cases and umbrellas uh, who were hopping down the street like a bunny because they were reporting to work for the Ministry of Silly Walks. Well, that's just pure uh, outlandish nonsense absurdity, and that is the, uh, the forte of British humor. The important thing about uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's, in fact, any time that you indulge in this kind of humor, whether it's modern TV or turn-of-the-century operettas, you have to play it straight. This is what W.S. Gilbert and Arthur Sullivan understood very well. And, you know, it's almost, they didn't really invent this sort of humor, but it seems like they did, because perhaps W.S. Gilbert's librettos were the first example of British humor to go global, in a sense. Uh, HMS Pinafore and Pirates of Penzance were just as popular in America and all over the Western world as they were in the United Kingdom. Uh, in you know, late 19th century terms, they went viral, you might say. So uh, British humor became exported on a global basis in a way that it had never been before. And the important thing is that the characters in these uh, uh, comedies cannot 
uh, acknowledge their own silliness. They don't know that they are absurd. It has to be played straight. And that's what makes it funny to us. If the actors were in on the joke, it would not be as funny. Now, there's a good example of that. When Mikado opens, we're in the town of Titipu in legendary uh, Japanese times uh, in the uh, uh, you know, time of the samurais and so forth. Now, the essential humor, the essential irony, the essential absurdity of the Mikado is that we're in Japan. The men have their hair pulled back like shoguns. The women have their hair uh, piled up on their heads like geishas. They're wearing kimonos and uh, robes, uh, very authentic. They have the makeup very much like Japanese. You see probably cherry blossoms and very exotic Japanese-looking sets. We're in Japan, and yet when you hear the characters talk, they sound like this. Oh, yes, there's a good fellow. Let's have a crumpet and a cup of tea, eh? What? They're just pompous British men, totally absurd. It's uh, The British humor is uh, making fun of British politics, British government. Uh, it's totally artificial that they're in Japan. So that's what we laugh at. Now, we have Nankipu, who is traveling in disguise as a wandering minstrel. He's really the son of the emperor, known as the Mikado. And he is hoping to marry the lovely Yum Yum, but Yum Yum has always been uh, the ward of the uh, Lord High Executioner Coco. However, he's heard that Coco is in trouble with the law, so he's thinking that perhaps Yum Yum might be available now. So he arrives in Titipu, and he's uh, looking for information about this situation. He begins with a recitative before he sings his first solo. Now, I want you to listen to this recitative because the interesting thing about it is there's nothing comic whatsoever. If you heard it in any opera by Rossini or Donizetti, if it were in the appropriate language, it would not sound out of place. This is the example of playing it straight. And the humor is the overarching humor that... A, a very British young man is dressed up in Japanese costume and uh, presenting himself as Japanese. However, he's not really saying anything humorous. Here's uh, playing it straight in Rechtative. Gentlemen, I pray you tell me where a gentle maiden dwelleth named Yum Yum, the ward of Coco. In pity speak, oh speak, I pray you. Why, who are you who ask this question? Come gather round me, and I'll tell you. So so you're thinking, uh, what's so funny about this funny comedy? Well, listen carefully. He's now going to sing his opening number, and like most tenors who come on in scene one, act one, he's just going to introduce himself to us. He is providing his cover story, that he's not royalty, but that he is a wandering minstrel, and that famous number, A Wandering Minstrel Eye, it's one of the hit tunes from the show. You remember it. Here's a little of the opening. A thing of shreds and patches Of ballad songs and snatches A dreamy lullaby My catalogue is long To every passion ranging And to your humors changing Now, for the rest of the song, he goes on to demonstrate the types of ballads that he has in his repertoire should anyone wish him to sing. He's showing off his catalog, as it were. Now, he's a Japanese minstrel. Shouldn't he be singing Japanese folk tunes like Cherry Blossoms? Bum, bum, ba, dum, dum, da, bum, bum, ba, bum, 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 bum. Well, yes, but instead, what does he give us? Uh, for instance, he gives us a rousing British patriotic anthem. <laughs> But if 
patriotic sentiment is wanted by patriotic bandits cut and dried. For wherever our country's banner may be planted, all other local banners are defied. The warriors in serried ranks assemble, never quail how they conceal it if they do. And I shouldn't be surprised if nations tremble before the mighty troops, the troops of T.T. about as Japanese as my left foot. Uh, and then uh, after that, he goes on to another example. And what do we get? We get an English sea shanty. And if you call for a song of the sea, we'll heave the captain around. With a yo he ho for the wind is fleet, harangue as a trip and a helm, a leak, hurrah for the homeward bound. Yo ho he ho, hurrah for the homeward bound. In a howling breeze may tickle a landsman's taste But the happiest are our sailor sees Is when he's down at an inland town With his Nancy on his knees Yo-ho! And his arm around her waist So the first element of the characteristics of British humor that we've identified are the absurdity of... Uh, the characters that are so ridiculous and so unbelievable that we don't empathize and laugh with them, we're laughing at the sheer nonsense. Uh, a second is uh, something that any Englishman will uh, admit cheerfully is a source of rich humor in that culture, and that is the ancient British class system. Now, you know, in our country, we like to tell our children that it doesn't matter what kind of family you're from, or how poverty-stricken or humble your circumstances, if you work hard, you can grow up to be the president someday. It is just not like that in England. Uh, children cannot dream of one day being the king or the queen. It is not going to happen. The fact is that in England, uh, the circumstances of your birth have a lot to do with your station in life. Some kids are automatically different than other kids because they're born into an aristocratic family. It's just how it is. And the British are hyper aware of this. Therefore, in England, uh, people who are, people are expected to know their place in life. If you are a chimney sweep or uh, some sort of utility worker, that is your fate, and you are supposed to accept it. People who try to improve their station are referred to as putting on airs, and this has always been the source of humor. Once again, most of the British comedies on TV that you see on WHRO TV have to do with uh, the inequities of the class system, the upstairs versus the downstairs. And think of characters like, oh, Andy Cap in the comics, and the, probably the classic example is from the musical comedy My Fair Lady in the character of Alfred P. Doolittle. Here you have this cockney ne'er-do-well who winds up rubbing elbows with the refined professor Henry Higgins and giving him lectures on linguistics and politics and everything else. Uh, we laugh at Alfred P. Doolittle, but I'm not sure that we can possibly find him as funny as a native British uh, citizen would find him simply because of that uh, inherent humor in uh, someone of low est estate trying to improve his station. And where do we find this in the Mikado? Well, that would be in the character of Coco. Coco uh, makes a grand entrance because he holds in the town of Titipu the very important uh, municipal post of Lord High Executioner. And when he makes his entrance, the entire town is singing with great pomp and ceremony, uh, hailing him as you might hail any kind of noble. Uh, you've probably heard it. Here, they, here he makes his entrance to music that is very grand. <laughs> Jail. 
by a set of curious chanters, liberated then on bail, on my own recognized answers. But when he started to tell us his story, what was his story? Is he a big, high and mighty fellow? Well, actually, he was a common criminal. He tells us that he's liberated from the county jail, <laughs> on bail, on his own recognizance. Uh, he's nobody. He is a, a petty thief, probably. And the reason that he's the Lord High Executioner is probably because nobody else in the town wanted to do it. So he is that character of humble estate who has improbably wound up with an important position. Now it's time to meet the ingenue. Uh, that would be the lovely Yum Yum and her two sisters. Uh, they make their entrance in, again, one of the familiar numbers. I know you'd be disappointed if I didn't play you a little bit of it. Uh, this is a number that was featured in that uh, Academy Award-winning film Chariots of Fire uh, from years ago. Uh, they're going to describe their life as young, innocent maidens living a carefree life in the famous Three Little Maids. Oh, Arthur Sullivan, you never did better. That is music that sparkles and will sparkle as long as operetta is performed. And, of course, Arthur Sullivan's tragedy is that he failed to recognize that this was his destiny. This was his claim to immortality. He longed to write Wagnerian opera. He longed to write operas like uh, oh, maybe the Scone of the Nibelung or operas like Verdi. He tried his hand at grand opera. He should have understood that he found the thing he was good at because nobody has ever written music more lively or charming than that. Now, let's move on to a third element of British humor that's different from our American humor. Um, American musicals, Lerner and Lowe, uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein, any of the modern ones, even Stephen Sondheim, try to represent honest a human emotion. There is sentiment. Uh, I always feel cheated in a musical if I don't get that moment that produces a lump in the throat. You know, the boy gets the girl, the boy loses the girl, they go through adversity, and when that moment comes, maybe when the boy gets the girl back again, you want that heartwarming feeling of arrival, that moment that makes you go, oh, and just remember your own courtship perhaps when you were younger and, and just have a warm, fuzzy, runny feeling inside, right? The British could not care less about this. They are as unsentimental as it is possible to be. You would think that honest human emotion would cause anaphylactic shock, that it was something to be avoided at all costs. Let's do a little contrast because I want to play you the Yum Yum Nanki Poo love duet. But first, let's play a love duet from Rodgers and Hammerstein. Laurie and Curly in Oklahoma. Now, they have something in common with Nanki Poo and Yum Yum. They don't want people to know that they're carrying on and that they're in love. Their love affair is supposed to be a secret. So here's a little bit of Curly in his part of the love duet with suggestions on how to keep it all undercover. Don't praise my charm too much Don't look so vain with me Don't stand in the rain with me People will say we're in love 
Okay, now is it corny? Well, no, I don't think it's corny. It is a little sentimental, it's charming, it's highly romantic, and it's realistic. Now, Nanky Poo and Yum Yum have the same problem. You see, uh, Yum Yum is engaged to marry Coco because she has been, uh, he has been her guardian. Uh, however, they want to be together, so they steal a little uh, together time after three little maids. And Coco, is, uh, I'm sorry, Nanky Poo is going to come up with a suggestion as to how they should behave, which becomes, again, ridiculous, ironic, and totally devoid of sentiment. In fact, in this passage you're about to hear, the idea of romantic sentiment in a love duet is itself being mocked. Oh, in spite of all temptation, such a thing I'll not discuss, and on no consideration will I kiss you Let me make it clear to you, this is what I'll never do. This, oh, this, oh, this, oh, this, this is what I'll never, never do. This, oh, this, oh, this, oh, this, this is what I'll never do. Just when you think that you're going to get a charming moment of romance, it turns ironic as they sit there talking about how they'll never kiss each other while they're kissing each other is like it's going out of style. And it's wonderful. Um, of course, there is another element to British humor that is not particularly British. Uh, it's, it's a familiar aspect of Gilbert and Sullivan, but you find it in all operettas, in all cultures, even from countries that don't produce operettas, like Italy. And that is wordplay. The phenomenon of the patter song. Oh, we hear it in Mozart. We hear it in Rossini. We hear it in Stephen Sondheim. We hear it... Uh, in many American musicals, uh, you get it in uh, Johann Strauss and Franz Lehár, but probably Gilbert was the past master of patter songs. Uh, we have a trio near the end of Act One in which Pishtush, Puba, and uh, Coco are uh, mulling over the unattractive prospect of what decapitation would be like. That is the form of capital punishment in Titipu. And they uh, sing about the terrors of that big black block. To sit in solemn silence in a dull dark dock, in a pestilential prison with a light long dock, awaiting the sensation of a short, sharp shock, from a cheap and chippy chopper on a big black block, a dull dark dock, a light long dock, a short, sharp shock, a big black block. To sit in solemn silence in a pestilential prison, and awaiting the sensation of a cheap and chippy chopper on a big black Now, another aspect of humor that I think actually a lot of the credit goes to Sullivan and his ear for Italian opera styles is the predilection of Gilbert and Sullivan to mock pre-existing operas. You know, in a lot of Italian operas, and I'm thinking of Lucia de Lammermoor as the prime example, you always have that moment in which the uh, principal characters, uh, some of them are on stage with a big chorus, and something festive and happy is happening, a wedding or a signing of a peace treaty or what it, whatever it may be, when suddenly another character bursts in, disrupting the festivities with a dramatic announcement, a plot twist that upsets everybody, causes everything to a grind to a halt while the chorus screams in terror, Oh, heavens, this is a terrible development. What will we do? What will we do? And they launch into a big ensemble. You know, that happens twice, not once, but twice in Lucia, when Lucia is about to marry Lord Arturo Bucklaw, and the chorus is uh, toasting them, and suddenly in comes her old boyfriend, Edgardo, saying, Oh, you betrayed me! And they launch into the famous sextet while the chorus moans in, uh, in agony. And then later, 
uh, of course, after uh, when the when the mad scene is being introduced, the chorus is innocently celebrating the wedding that has just taken place when suddenly in bursts the priest Raimondo with the tragic news that Arthur has been uh, hacked to death by the mad bride. Uh, so this is something that is ripe for parody. And this is the kind of parody that is mother's milk to Gilbert and Sullivan. In the finale of Act One of the Mikado, we have my favorite scene in all of operetta. It just makes me burst out laughing every time. Uh, Nanki Poo's problem, uh, one of the reasons he is not free to marry Yum Yum is that he has already uh, been instructed by or ordered by his father, the Mikado, to marry the ugly, elderly, old hag, Katisha. Now, by the time we get to the uh, end of Act One, uh, Coco has brokered an arrangement with Nanki Poo, whereby for one, I, I won't, it's really too complicated. Go read the plot summary at vaopera.org. But the point is that Nanki Poo is going to be executed. However, for one month, he will be free to live in uh, married bliss with Yum Yum while he awaits his execution. So the chorus is celebrating this brief marriage when in bursts Katisha. She's going to do just like Edgardo in Lucia, and she's going to come in with the announcement that will stun everybody that he is not a wandering minstrel. He is the son of the Mikado. However, in this marvelous scene, the chorus gets a little bit anxious, and they kind of keep coming in a little early. I'll tear the mask from your disguising. Now comes the blow. Prepare yourself for new surprising. I'll foil my foe. No minstrel he, despite bravado. Katisha can't catch a break. They ruined her big dramatic entrance. Now, of course, the one character that we haven't met yet, and we will see his entrance in Act Two, is the, our titular character, the Mikado himself. Um, an interesting musical thing happens uh, with the entrance of the Mikado. And again, it's a little bit more of that serendipity I was talking at the opening of the program this afternoon in the connection with Puccini's Madama Butterfly. Now, the fact that you had two Japanese operas uh, composed within a few decades of each other in the early 20th century and late 19th century is no coincidence. We had this phenomenon of a spurt of interest in all things Japanese towards the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century because, of course, Japan was opened to the West for the first time. You'll recall us talking about this when uh, Butterfly was staged last year uh, in the middle of the uh, 1800s, and uh, there was intense interest in learning about the Japanese culture, Japanese music, Japanese cuisine, and the lifestyle, and so forth. And European composers had fresh material to dramatize. Uh, it was called Japanisme. So uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado was one example of this, and Butterfly was another. Uh, Puccini was well familiar with the Mikado. He was really kind of a walking, talking encyclopedia of, of all musical styles and all operas and operettas. He was a very learned musician and owned a piano score of the Mikado. And both Arthur Sullivan and Giacomo Puccini 
made a rather cursory study of Japanese folk music. Uh, Sullivan uh, researched Japanese folk tunes, and uh, Puccini uh, made friends with the wife of the Japanese ambassador to Rome, and she uh, brought him uh, samples of Japanese music, which he incorporated into Butterfly. And it, so it shouldn't be too surprising that their interests intersected a bit. The same tune is used in both operas. It is a Japanese tune called My Prince, and it is sung in a fairly uh, primitive fashion by the villagers of Titipu when the Mikado makes his entrance in that section known as Miyasaba. Sounds like this. Now, in the second act of Madame Butterfly, there is a scene in which uh, Chocho-san, while futile, uh, futilely awaiting the return of Lieutenant Pinkerton, uh, receives a gentleman caller, Prince Yamadori, who is hoping, uh, hoping to uh, convince her to abandon Pinkerton and marry him. Now, he is a prince, so it would kind of make sense that this would be the spot where Puccini might employ the tune known as My Prince. And here it is. It's in a much more romantic, uh, Italianate version, so you have to listen carefully, but the outlines of the same tune are there for the entrance of Prince Yamadori. <laughs> So that's just kind of cool, a little bit of trivia for you to share with your friends and maybe win a bar bet or two. Um, moving on, another example of British humor. Uh, again, you know, the British are quite aware of their own predilection towards eccentricity and oddness, and that's kind of endearing of them. You know, think of some of the friends you know. When they're able to recognize their own silliness at times, it makes that silliness a lot easier to take, doesn't it? The British are quite willing to mock themselves. And as we all know, the history of British music prior to the 19th century was not as extensive and not as distinguished as you find in France, Germany, Italy, and so forth. Uh, frankly, after the days of Henry Purcell in the 17th century, it's hard to find uh, British composers whose music uh, really is uh, as meritous as, uh, as those of other countries. A lot of British song exists that is based on the poetry of Shakespeare and uh, poets such as Shakespeare. Uh, poetry has always been more the natural bent of uh, British, uh, the British nation than music. You know, you think of Shakespeare, Milton, Keats, Yeats, Byron, Shelley, and so forth. They express themselves in words. And you have song lyrics from Shakespeare, which are quite pastoral and always have a lot of refrains of tra-la-la, with a daddy-daddy down, hey, nanny nanny, all this kind of thing. And so when you set those songs to music, they have a tendency to achieve a rather quaint musical character. Uh, this is something that Arthur Sullivan is going to have fun with in the Mikado, but to give you an example of the British able to make fun of themselves, let's listen to Anna Russell describe a little bit the nature of the British folk song. The British seem to prefer, above all others, a style of singing that is very rarely heard in this country, and which I shall call the clear white or nymphs and shepherd style. <laughs> its characteristic is its utter purity. <laughs> This is The Spring by Henry Curet. <laughs> oh, how I love the spring when nymphs and 
shepherds dance in a ring. The birdies sing so sweet. Tweet, 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 tweet. How sweet, how sweet is spring. <laughs> and there you have it. Um, something very much like this is going to arise towards the end of uh, the Mikado. You know, we've got these uh, two couples, Nanki Poo and the ugly old hag Katisha, the clown Coco and the lovely Yum Yum. Obviously, they need to trade women, these two guys. We want the attractive young couple together, and we want the clown and the elderly woman to wind up together. That's, that's what the audience is waiting for. And indeed, they, through a series of uh, comic uh, complications, we do finally arrive at this arrangement. And so there's going to be a trio in which uh, uh, the characters are exulting about this to the extent that they can. Uh, this is the number, The Flowers That Bloom in the Spring, Tra-La, very much in the Nymphs and Shepherds Hey Nani Nani vein that we're discussing. First, Nankipu, who's getting the good end of the stick in this case, he's going to wind up with the Babelicious Babe, he's going to sing a happy verse. Now, the, the humor arrives when Coco has to do his verse, because he's got the unpleasant reality of spending the rest of his life with someone whose face looks like nine miles of bad road. So he's got nothing to celebrate. However, he's got to carry on and sing the song that has, he can't change the song, but he's not going to really have his heart in it. One of my favorite numbers from the Mikado. that bloom in the spring to a lovely promise of merry sunshine as we merrily dance and we sing to a we welcome the hope that they bring to a of a summer of roses and wine of a summer of roses and wine and that's what we mean when we say that a thing is welcome as flowers that bloom in the spring Tra la 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 la, tra la 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 la, for flowers that bloom in the spring. Tra la la la, tra la 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 la, tra la 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 la. The flowers that bloom in the spring, tra la, have nothing to do with the case. I've got to take under my wing, Trala, a most unattractive old thing, Trala, with a caricature of a face, with a caricature of a face. And that's what I mean when I say or I sing, oh, bother the flowers that bloom in the spring. tra la 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 tra la 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 oh, bother the flowers of spring. Yeah, I think I'll kill myself. Tra la 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 la. Quaint to the end because they're British, aren't they? Now, I'm going to play you another number, and this is the kind of thing that if you didn't know any different, you might listen to it and say, well, Glenn, you're wrong about the lack of sentimentality and honest human emotion, because just uh, in the abstract, it might seem to be an extremely emotional number. And I'm speaking of the number that follows the duet that you just heard, uh, when Katisha has a moment alone on stage to kind of... Uh, wallow in her misery, understanding that nobody wants her, nobody loves her because she's ugly, and that is her ugliness is her curse. She sings a recitative and an aria, O oh, Living I. Now, go ahead and listen to it, and it's, it's lovely, and it seems to be full of real human emotion, but we'll talk about it on the other side. Here's a bit of O oh, Living I.
Sounds pretty intense, doesn't it? Sounds real and genuine, huh? But you know, something always bothered me about that number. I couldn't quite put my finger on where I thought I'd heard it before. And then it occurred to me. Actually, what you just heard is another example of parody. It's not serious at all. About ten years prior to the composition of the Mikado, Giuseppe Verdi came out with uh, his grand opera Don Carlo, in which we have a character of the Princess Eboli, a mezzo like Katisha. Princess Eboli is not ugly. She is very beautiful. However, her beauty is her curse, because it leads her to make several bad choices which wind up ruining a number of lives and so forth. And at a similar juncture in the opera, towards the end, prior to the finale, Princess Eboli sings a marvelous aria, O Don Fatale, O Fatal Gift of Beauty, in which she rues the fact of her beauty and wishes that things had been different, and O oh, poor me, Oh, how did I get in this situation? I want you to listen to it, because I think that Arthur Sullivan had this section of Odon Fatale in mind when he turned it upside down and made Katisha rue her ugliness. Here's Eboli ruing her beauty. The vocal lines are so similar that I really think it kind of, uh, when you hear them side by side, I think it becomes pretty clear. The joke is that they're singing very similar passages, but turned upside down. The latter was uh, re regretting beauty, whereas Katisha is regretting her ugliness. Well, of course, it all works out in the end, because Coco rises to the occasion and decides to make the best of it, and when he uh, meets up with uh, Katisha to tell her what's going on, they discover, to their mutual astonishment, that they actually like each other. And you know, actually, this isn't going to be too bad. We'll be fine. It's a happy ending. Hooray. So they're going to sing their love duet. So what are we going to get here? Are we going to get... Uh, it's going to be an upbeat number. It's going to be a nice way to bring the comedy to a close. But how real is it going to be? Can we finally lose the irony? Can we finally just enjoy two people finding happiness together? Listen carefully to the words. I think you'll see irony is just all over every moment of the Mikado like white on rice. There is beauty in extreme old age. Do you fancy you were elderly enough? Information I'm requesting on the subject interesting is the maiden all the better when she's tough. Oh, up to my dominion, it's the general opinion that she lasts a good deal longer when she's tough. Are you old enough to marry, do you think? Won't you wait until you're 80 in the shade? There is fascination, frantic, and ruin that's romantic. Do you think you are sufficiently decayed? For the matter that you mention, I have given some attention, and I think I am sufficiently decayed. You grant this soul sing, Jenny, don't get it. It's evident, very odd, he's the one. Away we go, and never be married or hardly married till day is done. If that this soul sing, Jenny, don't get it. It's evident, very odd, he's the one. Away we go, and never be married or hardly we have a little bit of the English Music Hall to go along with the other array of musical textures and colors and styles that uh, Arthur Sullivan has presented to us. We've had a little Lucia de Lammermoor. We've had a little uh, Shakespearean Hey Nani Nani quaint English art song. We've had uh, some Don Carlo 
Uh, we've had sea shanties. We've had uh, military <laughs> pomp and circumstance, and patriotic anthems, uh, all in the name of uh, uh, making an absurd, fictitious portrayal of pseudo-Japanese culture just to make us laugh. So once again, when you come to the Mikado, and I know you will, you're not going to let this opportunity go by, are you? Of course not. We'll see you in a week's time. Just be looking. Uh, think while you're watching. Think about the nature of British humor. Look for absurdity. Look for irony. Look for lack of sentimentality. Look for uh, class struggles. And uh, look for the, uh, the rise of the unlikely a uh, person of humble estate, all of those things that uh, American audiences find so attractive and yet are usually missing in our own kind of heartfelt homespun comedies. We're so normal, and they're so odd over there on the other side of the Atlantic, and we love them for it. Well, thanks for joining me this afternoon. We'll be back in the fall to uh, present some more discussions of our exciting 2012-2013 season. Uh, we'll see you then, but before then, we'll see you at the Harrison Opera House for Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. <laughs>